Welcome to the Implementing CDBG webinar series presented by the New Hampshire Community Development Finance Authority, also known as CDFA. My name is Kathleen Weisenberger, and this module is titled Procurement and Contracting. You can download the slides to follow along from the CDFA website. So let's get started. This module is going to be talking about when and why procurement is required when utilizing CDBG, how to purchase goods and services in accordance with the requirements of CDBG. We're gonna summarize the five methods of procurement and give a little explanation of the difference between an RFP and an RFQ. Recipients of CDBG funds are responsible for ensuring that the goods and services that they procure uh, competitively and in accordance with the established procurement rules and regulations. Local grantees must follow the federal regulations at 2 CFR 218 through 236. They have to maintain oversight to ensure that all of their contractors and consultants are performing. They have to maintain written standards of conduct, including conflict of interest, that govern the actions of their employees. Grantees must also review the transactions uh, to avoid any unnecessary or duplicative purchases. Who decides what's unnecessary? Well, if you refer to 2 CFR 200, there are an explanation of necessary goods and services in there. But the key is, if it's not in your grant agreement with CDFA and necessary to accomplish the project that you have set up to meet the national objective and eligible activity, then it's probably an unnecessary cost. Municipalities must also only contract with responsible contractors and maintain written records for every procurement to sufficiently detail the process of that procurement so when CDFA or HUD or the general public come in, they can see what was done and how procurements were utilized using CDBG funds. Local governments also have to have written procedures on how they will handle uh, and resolve any disputes that are related to procurement actions. Should this happen, make sure that you notify CDFA immediately that there has been a protest or an issue with a procurement. We also talked about conflict of interest in the grantee requirements module. Uh, it does apply to not only procurements, but to other areas in a CDBG program. It applies to municipal officials, their employees, to any subrecipients or nonprofits you may be utilizing, anyone in a decision-making capacity, and family members of those people in decision-making positions. There are also two types of conflicts. There are beneficiary conflicts and procurement conflicts. Again, in the grantee requirements module, we go into much more detail about conflict of interest. As part of your procurement utilizing CDBG funds, it is important that you take affirmative steps to ensure that minority firms, women firms, and uh, people in labor surplus areas are used whenever possible. And there are several ways to do that. You can place qualified firms on solicitation lists, divide your large projects into smaller tasks. For example, if you're doing a large construction project, you can put out your bid in separate divisions and utilize small and diverse business programs within your state and also require your prime contractors to take some affirmative steps as well. In New Hampshire, you will need to contact the Department of Transportation Disadvantaged Business Program, contact the EEO coordinator, and you will give them your invitation for bid or your requests for proposal or qualifications, and they will send them out to all of the certified MBE and WBE firms in New Hampshire. It's also important to note that CDFA has a goal of 6.9% participation for both MBE and WBE entities on all of their projects. You will need to utilize Form 7-1 as uh, what are part of the front end documents, and they are also on the CDFA website as well as the implementation guide. 
Procurement in Section 3. Many of you have heard about Section 3. Section 3 requires that to the greatest extent possible, any new employment or training opportunities are provided to those Section 3 people. Any contracts that are awarded should be given priority to Section 3 businesses. And there are goals in the federal regulations. They are goals, they are not requirements. But what does that mean? Who is a Section 3 resident? A Section 3 resident is a resident of public housing or a low to moderate income person who resides in the project area in which the HUD assisted project is located. For the state program, so for the CDFA, CDBG program in New Hampshire, because you are working in the non-entitlement areas, HUD has designated the non-urban county as the project area. So in order to be an LMI person in the project area and qualify as Section 3, you do not have to reside in the small town or city. It's anyone that is low to moderate income or residing in public housing within that non-urban county would qualify as a Section 3 resident. A Section 3 business concern, on the other hand, is a business that is either owned by a Section 3 resident, so it could be a small business independently operated by a Section 3 person. It could be a person that employs a substantial number of Section 3 residents, meaning 30% of their full-time positions are held by Section 3 residents, or they subcontract with other businesses that are owned or employed and qualify as Section 3. They would have to give at least 25% of the total dollar award to those subcontractors. Section 3 applies to CDBG and the home program, if you're familiar with that. Section 3 applies to housing rehab, it applies to lead hazard abatement, it applies to housing construction, which we don't do with CDBG funds. Um, it also applies to any other public construction projects. There are thresholds for the Section 3 compliance requirement. Um, if your municipality has received $200,000 or more, Section 3 applies to your entire project. Any individual contract that you award, if it is more than $100,000, it applies to that contractor as well. If the contract is for less than $100,000, it does not apply directly to that contractor. And again, there's more information on Section 3 um, in the CDFA's implementation guide for CDBG on their website. You will be required in New Hampshire to utilize the CDFA Section 3 Compliance Plan. Um, the Section 3 Compliance Plan can be found on the CDFA website, and it includes um, the Section 3 clauses in all advertisements uh, for procurement. It requires uh, the Section 3 information to be in all contracts. Um, some other requirements are checking the HUD registry, uh, having a pre-construction meeting, pre-bid meetings are strongly encouraged um, to, to make sure that you are facilitating with those prime contractors um, upfront as early as possible, all of the things that they can do and that you can do to help them achieve Section 3 new hires should there be any. Another requirement for procurement in the CDBG program is competition. And the regulations require that there must be open and full competition. You are not allowed to utilize geographic preference unless it's specifically allowed under federal law. In the CDBG program under 2 CFR 200, the only time you are allowed to use geographical preference is in the procurement of architectural and engineering services. And if you do utilize geographic preference for architectural and engineering services, there must still be enough people within that geographic area that you are allowing for full and open competition. 
I would strongly suggest if you are thinking about using geographic preference in the procurement of architectural or engineering services, that you check with CDFA to make sure that the number of potential responders will meet their definition of full and open competition. Your procurements must also have written selection procedures. So any RFP, RFQ, invitation for bid um, must have written procedures that are made available and must be followed in the evaluation and selection of those uh, contractors or consultants. It must be very clear in the bidding documents what those evaluation criteria are. And if you're utilizing any pre-qualified lists, uh, that list must be kept current and you must allow new participants to qualify to submit information and documentation to be added to that pre-qualified list. Again, I would strongly encourage if you're thinking about the use of a pre-qualified list in New Hampshire, that you contact your CDFA staff and make sure that you're following their requirements um, and that you are still allowing for open and full competition. Pre-bidding requirements with CDBG. You are required, according to 2 CFR 200, to get a cost estimate prior to any procurement activity. So before you solicit an invitation for bid, before you send out an RFP or an RFQ solicitation, before you do any type of small purchase acquisition, you must have a written cost estimate documented so that it is clear when you are monitored or audited that you had an idea of what that should cost you and that your cost estimates and the price that you eventually paid were reasonably close. Another requirement prior to any bidding activity or solicitation activity is that you must have environmental release of funds. You may not bid a construction project, issue an invitation for bid, put an advertisement in the newspaper prior to receiving environmental release of funds from CDFA. Property acquisition should be completed. If you are requiring property acquisition, easement acquisition, temporary easement acquisition, all of those things should be completed following the Uniform Relocation Act um, prior to putting a project out to bid. Again, you will find more information on these things in the implementation guide on the CDFA website. Procurement methods. There are five types of procurement methods. Micro-purchase, small purchase, competitive sealed bid, competitive proposal, and non-competitive or sole source. Micro-purchase is best suited to obtaining very small quantities of supplies. It must be less than $10,000. It may be awarded without competitive quotes if the price is considered reasonable, and you must distribute any micro-purchases equitably among qualified suppliers. Well, what do we mean by that, distributing micro-purchases equitably among qualified suppliers? If you're using micro-purchase for um, small purchase of uh, office supplies or things like that. The idea is that you are not always utilizing the same company or the same purchase. You have more than one qualified supplier of something in your area that you would utilize more than one. Small purchase is also best suited to obtaining small quantities of supplies or small service contracts. It must be less than 250,000, and competition is sought through either oral or written price quotations. If you are doing a micro purchase or a small purchase, and it is less than the current small purchase threshold of 250,000, a written and detailed cost estimate prior to procurement is not absolutely necessary but it is very important that you document why the price that you paid was reasonable. So if you're going to the Office Max website to purchase paper, you would make sure that 
the price that Office Max is charging is reasonable compared to Staples and other uh, suppliers of paper. Uh, but you would not need a written cost estimate in advance under $250,000. Competitive sealed bid is typically used in the procurement of construction contracts. Uh, the award is based on a fixed bid price and it is awarded to the firm that is the most responsive and responsible low bid. The key with competitive sealed bid is that you must award the contract to the lowest bidder if that low bidder is deemed to be responsive and responsible. If they are not deemed to be responsive and responsible, meaning they didn't submit all of the required documents to the bid request, or they have not been uh, determined to be a responsible bidder, maybe they're not actually qualified to do the work that they are responding to, then you may go to the next highest bidder, um, but otherwise you must go with the low bid. It's also important to understand that you're gonna have to submit all of your construction documents to CDFA before the award of the contract. So what are those steps? From a high level, the first step in a competitive sealed bid procurement is to obtain the wage decision if you have determined that your project is subject to Davis-Bacon prevailing wage, which you can hear more about in the labor standards module. You will prepare your invitation for bid or what we call the IFB. You will publish the IFB in a newspaper of general circulation. You will solicit WB and MBE participants. You confirm the wage rates, issue any addenda if necessary. If wage rates have changed or any other um, specificities of the bid have changed from the architect or the engineer, you would also issue addenda. Conduct a pre-bid meeting. Pre-bid meetings are really important to go over with the potential bidders all of the requirements that they will have to follow if they are awarded a CDBG contract. This is where we can talk to them about all of the bonding requirements and the Section 3 requirements and the Davis-Bacon weekly payroll requirements. So pre-bid meetings are extremely important. Next, you will receive the bids. You will open the bids at a public meeting. You will make your vendor selection. And in New Hampshire, you will submit all of those documents to CDFA prior to official award of the contract. And then you will hold a pre-construction meeting with the selected contractor to once again go over all of the requirements and collect the documents from them in terms of insurance and bonds and so forth. Competitive proposal method is also sometimes called the competitive negotiation method. This method has two subtypes, a request for proposal and a request for qualifications, or sometimes request for qualifications is called QBS, or qualifications-based selection. When you are using the competitive proposal or competitive negotiation method, you will be doing either a fixed price or a not to exceed type of contract. And you are typically using the RFP and the RFQ in the selection of professional services such as architectural and engineering or grant administration. A competitive proposal must clearly and accurately state what the requirements are for the goods and services that you are procuring. You must publicize the RFP and honor any reasonable requests for an opportunity to compete. The proposals must be solicited from an adequate number of qualified sources. And the grantee must conduct a technical evaluation of the submitted proposals. It's again important that the request for proposal, the advertisement, the documentations that are sent to any solicited contractors all have the same evaluation criteria that is actually used by the selection committee when evaluating the responses. The grantee would then conduct negotiations with the selected uh, bidder, if you will, 
based on their responsive and responsible offer and including the price. All the selection criteria would be considered and then you would conduct negotiations uh, with the um, selected contractor and then the contract would be awarded to them. The key with a request for proposal is that price is allowed to be part of the selection criteria. There is no restriction on how price is weighted as long as it is clearly stated in your selection criteria and evaluation criteria that price will be part of the evaluation. When you're utilizing competitive negotiation or competitive proposal, you do not need to hire the lowest bid. You use all of the selection criteria to determine who you would like to negotiate and contract with. The next uh, piece of competitive proposal or competitive negotiation, again, the request for qualifications or the QBS qualifications-based selection. This method of procurement may only be used for architectural and engineering services when you are utilizing CDBG. Price is not used as a selection factor and cannot be taken into consideration. The bidders are actually evaluated on who is the most qualified based on your technical scope of work and the requirements that you put out in your solicitation. When you are negotiating under the RFQ or RFP, you would negotiate with the top ranked firm with a detailed cost analysis of their uh, proposed price and you may go back and forth with them as frequently as you want. When they have told you what it's going to cost, you tell them that's not in your budget. You may go back and forth as often as you feel. But once you have determined that you will not be able to come to an agreement on price with your first selection under the RFQ process, you get a last and final offer from them you go on to your second highest qualified firm. But once you have moved on to your second highest firm based on qualification only, you may not go back to the previous uh, bidder. If they say, oh, we didn't realize that you weren't serious and maybe we can lower our price a little bit more. Once you've asked for that last and final offer and decided to move on to the next uh, qualified, you may not go back. So the overall steps in both RFP and RFQ is prepare the solicitation, which would include the scope of work, what it is you need, any time frames that are required. You would solicit WB and MBE and publish your uh, RFP, RFQ notice in a paper of general circulation. You would establish an evaluation committee. You would open responses that are received, and then make your vendor selection. Again, when you notify the proposers of who may or may not be added to a um, shortlist for interviews, um, or you may choose to go with one of the two respondents based on how many responses you get, but you notify everyone if they are either being interviewed, not being interviewed, or if they've been selected and you prepare the contract and then execute the contract. The key difference in that those steps is if you're using RFQ versus RFP is the steps in the negotiation process are slightly different because you select in the RFP the contractor based on, um, at least in part, the price that they have uh, given you and you should be contracting with them and it should be within the price that they offered you in the scope of work. In the RFQ, there is no price and so the process is gonna take you a little bit longer to get through the negotiation of the price and the contract. The last and final um, type of procurement is the non-competitive or sole source method. This method is used under only very limited circumstances. Um, you should contact CDFA before utilizing this method to make sure that you actually have a sole source procurement that would be eligible to utilize this method. And 
you must do a cost analysis and a cost estimate prior to utilizing this uh, method, regardless of the threshold that I mentioned earlier of the 250,000. If you want to use sole source, you will have to have a cost estimate and cost analysis prior to um, utilizing this method. This is something that is frequently only used in emergencies and again would require your contacting CDFA to make sure that they agree with the sole source method. Once you've done all of this procurement, you're going to have to document your compliance. One of my favorite sayings in the CDBG program is document, 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 because if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. Your documentation is the only proof that you have that you followed the state and federal requirements and that your CDBG expenditures are allowable and reimbursable. So you must have a description of the procurement policies and procedures that you used, and you must keep data on all contracts that you've awarded, such as the name of the contractor, the type of the contractor, the amount of the contractor. All of this has more detailed information in the record keeping module as well, but you will make sure that you've documented the procurement from beginning to end so that if anyone comes in from CDFA or HUD to monitor your procurement process, they can see what you did and how you did it. There are a few other procurement issues when utilizing CDBG funds. You have to have documents of those cost estimates that I mentioned. And again, there is a sample on how to do cost estimating as part of the CDBG implementation guide on the CDFA website. If you have projects that go over budget uh, when you put your bids out, um, there are ways to handle that. Number one, depending on how your bids were put out with alternates or ads and deducts, you may or may not have to rebid that procurement entirely. If you are getting low bids, you have to be very careful that you do not award, and again, this would be mostly pertaining to a sealed bid where you went with the lowest bid, but you must be careful that you do not have a contractor that comes in with a very low bid and immediately starts requesting change orders for additional money. You are limited in the amount of change orders that you can have. More of that is discussed in the labor standards module, but essentially you should not have change orders of more than 15 to 20% of the overall contract price. Grant administration services. Grant administration services should be procured prior to utilizing a grant administrator. There will be more information on this in the CDBG implementation guide and the upcoming CDBG subgrantee training provided by CDFA. In your documentation of compliance, as I mentioned, you will have records that show all of the work that you have done from beginning to end to make sure that the state has reviewed your procurement records and that um, they have all been in compliance with CDBG regulations. Now, when it comes to actual contracting, after you've done your procurement, you must check the list of federally debarred contractors at SAM.gov. You should check the HUD list of excluded parties on the HUD website. This is particularly relevant to housing programs but it should be checked to make sure that whoever you're contracting with has not been prohibited from working on HUD funded contracts in addition to maybe or maybe not being on the federally debarred list. And then there's also the New Hampshire debarred parties list. So you must check all of these locations before you enter into a contract utilizing CDBG funds with any uh, consultant, architect, nonprofit, grant administrator, everyone must be checked against the list of debarred contractors. And again, all of the documentation on your procurements must be submitted to CDFA through the grants management system prior to the submission of any construction claims. 
When you're putting your contracts together, CDFA has made it easy for you and created something called the front end documents. Those are attachment 7-14 as part of the implementation guide, but they include the mandatory contract provisions such as termination for cause and convenience, the record retention, access to records. It also has uh, information on section three, environmental review, and all of the reporting requirements. The mandatory contract provisions on a construction contract must also include the applicable wage determination from the Department of Labor if the project has been deemed to be subject to Davis-Bacon prevailing wage. You must have a copy of the HUD 4010 form attached to the contract as well. And those contracts must be in compliance with and be aware that they must be in compliance with the Copeland Anti-Kickback Act, the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act, the Davis-Bacon Act, and any contract and employment opportunities that they create should be made a priority available to Section 3 residents and business concerns. There are bonding requirements on construction projects utilizing CDBG funds. A bid bond, a performance bond, and a payment bond are all going to be required on your CDBG funded construction project. A bid bond, the first type of bond, the first one that a contractor will be required to submit, is used to assure their good faith intentions of their bid price. The bid bond in New Hampshire may not exceed 10% of the bid price, and it's submitted in a form that guarantees the fund's availability. Usually, this is a certified check or some other negotiable instrument um, that is assurance that the bidder, if they are selected, will execute the contract and be able to complete the project. Any checks are returned to the unsuccessful bidders after the selected contractor has been um, contracted with. The next one is a performance bond. A performance bond is used to ensure that the contractor completes the work according to the specifications in their contract. The performance bond must be equal to 100% of the contract price. You can keep a performance bond for up to one year after the completion of the contract, or in many instances, a municipality will release the performance bond, but secure a maintenance agreement for one to three years with the contractor. Again, this is the bond that ensures that the contractor performs according to the contract and their scope of work, and that you are getting whatever it is that you intended to get with your CDBG funds. It is protecting the CDBG investment in your project. The final bond is the payment bond. A payment bond is used to ensure payment to the subcontractors and suppliers. It must also be equal to 100% of the contract price. And this bond is used if, for some reason, the prime contractor has not paid the subcontractors on the project or any suppliers for materials used on the project to ensure that the project is completed and that no liens are taken against the CDBG funded project. The general contractor is the one that is required to maintain the payment bond. There are also insurance requirements as part of 2 CFR 200 that states that the contractor's certificate of insurance um, must be provided and it must ensure that the levels are adequate to cover the contract or the project. So it's very important, we talked about the pre-construction meeting, when you're collecting all of the contracts and the bonds and the documents from the contractors, you must make sure to look at those insurance documents that they provide to make sure that the level of insurance coverage that they have is high enough to cover the cost of the project that you are contracting with them. Another requirement of CDBG procurement is retainage. You must have a mutually agreed upon financial institution or kept in a separate account. If the 
contractor chooses to have the funds put into an escrow account where it can earn interest, it must be in a mutually agreed upon institution in a separate account and the interest earned on those funds belong to the contractor. Another option is to just reduce the drawdowns that are submitted to the state. This is the most common form used by grantees around the country. When the contractor submits their pay application, it reduces the draw by 10% for the retainage and the retainage is actually left with CDFA's treasury account and not drawn down. I mentioned before that in New Hampshire, the retainage may not exceed 10% of the total contract amount, and retainage may be released only after the municipality has received a release of liens. It's an AIA form numbered G706A, and it's essentially a document that they sign saying that they have been paid in full and they are releasing any ability to go back and put a lien on their project. So that's it for procurement with CDBG. Some of the things to review that we talked about is utilizing maybe WEBE or MBE, WBE contractors and companies in our CDBG projects and that CDFA has a 6.9% goal for participation. That section three should be reviewed with the bidders and the contractors prior to submitting bids and prior to selecting subcontractors so that they're aware that priority should be given to Section 3 businesses and any employment should be given a priority to Section 3 residents. We talked about the need for cost estimates as part of the 2 CFR 200 requirements and that cost estimates must be done in writing for anything above the small purchase threshold of 250000 but that you should have some form of um, documentation that shows you got the best price for the highest quality goods for any other procurement. We talked about what the different types of procurement were, and we talked about documenting your compliance is the only proof that you have that you did everything correctly. We talked about making sure that all contracts that anyone you're contracting with, that you check the different lists for debarred contractors. And that does not just mean construction contractors and subcontractors, but it also includes architectural and engineering firms and nonprofit organizations and grant administrators. And then we talked about the mandatory contract provisions when utilizing CDBG funds. If you have any additional questions on the procurement utilizing CDBG funds, please contact CDFA using the contact information on this slide.